Hey, it's Thursday. Time for Coffee with Rob. We're in Mark chapter 7. Almost halfway through the book already. Uh, just 20. This is lesson number 22. Hope everybody's doing good. How many of you are retired? I just got to ask a question. Um, I'll tell you, I'm busier now than I was when I was working two jobs full time. Uh, still working one, but wow. Tired, man. Whew. Anyway. Mark chapter 7, we're going to begin here. We know Jesus has just fed the 15,000, bad title, put in there by men, the 5,000. It's 5,000 men plus women and children. Remember that from the last one. John the Baptist was murdered. And of course, he was arrested earlier in the book of Mark, finally murdered in the last chapter. And now we're moving on to um, just, it's just kind of the fickleness of men. As we look at Mark chapter 7, how... Uh, one of the things that as a minister that you experience, or even as a young person, I want to encourage young people in the church to, uh, you know, really stay strong. Um, you're going to run into trouble um, usually as you try to become a part of a church, especially if it's an older church. And the, the one of the most harmful words that can happen in a church sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes is tradition. And Jesus addresses that. He addresses that here in Mark chapter 7, and he addresses tradition also in Matthew 15. And I use this quite often to help people, to encourage people, because what often happens with tradition is tradition will trump the Word of God. You know, things like, oh, we don't do that here, or we've never done it that way. You come in with an innovative idea. Say, you come into a church that's, you know, 60 or older, 50 or older. You come in at 25, and you're on fire for God. And you've got some new technological ideas or just some new ways that you're in touch with the younger generation. You're like, hey, can we do this at our church? And the, the answer you often get is no. Don't get discouraged. One of the things that I always told our young people at our church at Sugar Tree Ridge was hang in there, keep your vision, keep fighting because, you know, number one, I raise leaders, I don't raise followers. Number two, eventually we're going to hand the reins over to the young people. And if you don't invest in them now, older people in your church, traditional people in your church, thank you for doing a great job. Thank you for, you know, putting the bricks in place for the building that the kids are worshiping in. But sometimes you got to get out of the way. As long as they're consistent, as long as they're on fire, as long as they're not violating the word of God, it's okay. Let go. Let the young people take over if you can. Now, this is a unique thing about um, Sugar Tree Ridge that I love. In most places, churches where young people come up, they have all these visions and all these ideas, but they want the older people to pay for it. What I loved about Sugar Tree Ridge was we had a lot of younger people come in between 25 and 35. And they had visions for the church, for the future of the church, for the children of the church, but they were willing to pay the bill because it does cost money to run a church. Let's just be honest. So I love that about that church. And there are churches like that. So some of the older people just got to let go of these traditions because the tradition should never trump the word of God. You know, and I always say this, when you're growing a church, please listen to me on this. When you're growing a church, and you go to God and you say, God, please help us grow our church. Help us reach the community. Let me tell you something. If the spirit moves, he's going to move in ways you probably don't expect. And he's going to always say, he's going to bring people through your front door that may not look like you, may not act like you, may not talk like you, but man, they love God. You got to let them in. You got to get over yourself and let that tradition go and just focus on the word of God. And I also want to say another thing about the refugee situation. It's tough, but I look at it this way. And yes, I'm all American. I bleed red, white, and blue. If somebody's here to contribute to the, the greater good of our country, hallelujah. Let them stay. Help them out. And church, the mission field is no longer overseas. The mission field is in your backyard. Go out and win these people that came across the border to Jesus Christ. If you can, stand strong. You'll find out that, you know, previous missionaries have witnessed to some of these people. Some of them are open to the gospel. And just think of the money you save. If you want to look at it that way, you no longer have to go overseas. You no longer have to cross the border. You don't even need a passport. You can just go next door and start telling people about Jesus Christ. 
So the mission field is no longer overseas. God brought the mission field to you. Number one, America needs Jesus Christ. Number two, the people coming across the border. If there were 15 million over the border, they need Jesus too. And now you don't have to go overseas to get them. You just need to go across the street, across the room, or next door. So thank God for them, him bringing them over here, those people that are open to the gospel. Anyway, it's a criminal who wants to harm the country and all those other things needs to go. I agree with that 100, but I think that's in the, probably in the minority of the people that came over. But I started thinking about refugees, and I keep thinking, if I was in a country I didn't like, and I could look at America and go there and get a job and raise a family and be happy, I'd come here too. Well, I, there's no other place I want to go. So anyway, be open-minded with this refugee problem. Be open-minded with, with the new people coming. They don't look like you. They don't talk like you. They don't act like you. But there's one thing consistent through, all, through every culture in the world, and that is people need Jesus Christ. So be the individual that leads the people that come across the border to Christ. So, all right, I'll get, forget about that. Let's go into Matthew, or excuse me, Mark chapter 7, verse 1. So, uh, the Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law, here they come. Here come the Pharisees, here come the scribes. They had come from Jerusalem. Now, they're looking for Jesus. They're coming from Jerusalem to find him up north of, uh, of Galilee. And uh, they come from Jerusalem and gather around Jesus. And this is what they're doing. This is what they do to preachers. This is what I had to put up for 12 years in my last church. Sometimes people weren't even hearing what I said. They just had me under a microscope and were trying to pick me apart. The same thing with YouTube. I'm trying to give the truth of the gospel, and there'll be people who just want to pick you apart. They don't want to learn nothing. They just want to pick you apart. I'm still going to speak the truth. That's up to them. I don't respond to those people. But the Pharisees are some teachers of the law who came from Jerusalem, gathered around Jesus, not to learn, but to pick him apart. And they saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were unclean. What is that is unwashed? Unwashed hands. Oh my goodness, what a crime. We're going to make a mountain out of a molehill when people are going to hell. We're going to worry about people that didn't wash their hands. But notice what the problem is. The problem isn't scriptural. Now, I will always battle with somebody over scripture. Now, there's obviously there's... Uh, contention over scriptures that you're never going to solve. You, there's going to be an interpretation one way. One of them's over divorce and leaders in the church and things like that. And uh, this one here is unwashed hands. My goodness, what a sin. And so we look at verse 3. And the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding the keyword tradition of the elders. Now, this is what points this out. And Jesus knows this right away. And he, and this is in here for our example. This is in here for our benefit. The tradition of the elders. Again, young people, we're in a church where tradition rules. Yeah, some tr traditions need to go. And, and one of the ones you guys know I've talked about before is wearing your Sunday best. Yes, you should look good for church. Yes, you should look like you would at a football game. Or if you go out to party with your friends, just consider that. Go to a family event, you should dress appropriately. But let's not get all uh, caught up in suits and ties and three-piece suits and tuxedos and dresses and bonnets. If you want to look like that and wear that, fantastic for you. But let's not make that a requirement because it's not a biblical requirement. It's a traditional requirement. So holding the tradition of the elders. Now the tradition of the elders here is going to raise its head above the word of God. And Jesus is going to point that out in a minute. So they're not battling over something from scripture. They're battling from something that the elders invented. And so, for example, God gave us two rules. Jesus Christ gave us two rules. I think it's in Matthew 22, 37. That is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. I don't even know what the world finds a problem with that. Love God and love people. What's wrong with that? That's the two rules Jesus gave us. He said that all the law hangs on these two things. And the Ten Commandments hang on those two things as well. The first four commandments are pertaining to God himself. The next six are to other people. So look at that. All the law hangs on two things. But now they want to bring in the mission. It's like 60, 6,200, 6,800 pages full of man-made rules, man-made laws. This some rabbinical priest brought up. It's not scripture. It's tradition. It's, well, you know, anyway, I'm not going to get into that. Ceremonial washing, holding the tradition of the elders, and it rears its head, and it happens in churches against the word of God. Anything that comes up against the word of God should be struck down, unless there's an agreement. 
Our church had Santa Claus every Sunday. I didn't like the tradition whatsoever, but it wasn't worth fighting over. They did it for years before I got there. And, I, and if, you know, actually it gave me a little break on Christmas. I had to be there every Christmas. I haven't been home in 13 years for Christmas. And when I brought that up to the elders, they're like, oh, too bad. That's the way it is. And so Santa's coming. It would give me a little bit of a break to get home early. So when they come from the marketplaces, they do not eat unless they wash. So they're speaking of the tradition of the elders. We wash our hands. We wash our hands when we come home from the marketplace. We wash our hands before we eat. It's tradition. And they observe many other traditions such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. Now, I will say this. I'm a hand washer. I like to wash my hands every time I go out in public. If I go to the bathroom, anything I touch, I come home and I wash my hands. Why? Because it's been proven that clean hands stop a lot of disease. And I am a, not a germaphobe, but I like to wash my hands, especially when I go out in public. I come home and first thing I do is wash my hands. It's my tradition. It's something I hold to, to be hygienic. And that's merely what this is, but they're going to hold Jesus accountable for his disciples not washing their hands according to their tradition. And a tradition, by the way, I looked that up. The word is um, uh, paradosis, paradosis, P-A-R-A-D-O-S-I-S, which is an instruction handed down by men uh, uh, close to, it's being close to the real. In other words, it gives the appearance of being righteous and right and correct and godly, but it's not. It's a phony. And so that's what this word means. So this tradition is a paradosis. It's a, it's a handed down tradition that people have done. And out of respect, they do it for other people or in fear, they do it for other people. But it's not scripture. It's close to the truth, but it's not the truth. It's close to scripture but it's not scripture. So this is what this tradition is. Many other traditions such as these. And my gosh, there's 6,200 pages in the Mishnah. I can't follow all. There's 613 Jewish laws. Who can follow that? How many of you have trouble just following two? Loving God and loving your neighbor. Add more. That's just a burden God doesn't want to put on people. So, so, uh, and they observe many other traditions such as these. And I think you should wash your cups. You should wash your pistols. You can wash your kettles. It's what you should do to keep hygiene in your home. Women wash clothes. Men wash dishes. I wash our dishes here very often with a dishwasher. So the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders? How would you like to go to a church? Well, you know, there's the Bible, but we have a lot of rules here you need to follow. That's just, that's a deterrent. I don't want to be a part of that. I want to follow God. I want to see Jesus Christ when I go to my church. Why doesn't, why don't your people follow the tradition of the elders? Why don't your people follow the tradition made up by John Smith 50 years ago? No, man, this is such a horrible thing. And Jesus is about to point that out. So it's biblical or it needs to go away unless it enhances your church. Like we do caroling every year, something like that around the neighborhood. There's little traditions that happen during the holiday season. And those are fun. That enhances the celebration. It enhances the season. It's not a burden. It's not a requirement. It's a voluntary submission to a tradition to go out and have some fun. There's nothing wrong with that. If it becomes law, if it supersedes the word of God, that's a problem. So, so Jesus gets asked this question by the scribes and the Pharisees. Why do they do this? And why don't they keep the tradition of the elders? It doesn't say scripture. It says, instead of eating their food with unclean hands. And he replies, you know what? Now he's revealing the heart of these people. Now remember, just four chapters ago, they wanted to kill him. So just remember, look at the fickleness. And I wrote these down. They want to make him king. Then they want to kill him. Then they say he has a demon. Then they say he's a prophet. And then they say, well, he's a carpenter. He can't be the Messiah. Look at the fickleness of people. And look at the fickleness in society today. The woke movement. All these movements that come around. They come and they go. They change daily. Listen, the Bible is true from the beginning of time until through eternity, by the way. From the beginning of time through eternity. What should we be following? Biblical truth. These traditions are going to come and go. They come and go when somebody's famous or whatever. You know, whoever, whoever makes them up. But this is what Jesus' reply is in, in Mark chapter 7, verse 6. He says, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. Oh, man, that's the magic word for church, ain't it? 
Yeah, you know, I used to hate that word. I would say, you know, that people aren't hypocritical in a church, but I'm going to be honest and say, yeah, there are a lot of hypocrites in church. But that's not going to be an excuse for you when you stand before God and say, why didn't you go to church? Well, there was hypocrites there. Yeah, there's hypocrites everywhere. There's hypocrites in the restaurant you eat at. There's hypocrites at the place where you go to the nightclub. There's hypocrites that you hang out with as friends. There's when you go buy a car, the salesman you buy cars from might be a hypocrite. It doesn't stop you. It doesn't stop you from going to Kohl's and getting clothes or uh, Sears and J.C. Penney and all that. There's hypocrites everywhere. There's also hypocrites in the church that should not deter you from going to church on Sunday morning and meeting your Savior as in obedience to the Word of God. To say one man, one day a week for worship. That's God's day. And I don't even care. And I, I don't know. God hold me accountable. I don't know. But if you can sit at home on a Sunday morning and turn on your church, on your TV, and have coffee with your wife, break open the Word of God, and talk about the Scriptures and the message while it's going on on your internet or whatever, do it. Do something. Give it to God. Give Him at least an hour of a Sunday for worship, learning from the Word of God, developing your capacity to learn. My, my honest truth is the scriptures say go to the church physically, and we all should. It encourages everybody that, that are there. It encourages your pastor. I always used to love to see a full church. So Jesus says Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites as it is written. These people honor me with their lips. In other words, they sound great. And, I, and they sound, they talk a good game, man. Well, we got all these rules. You got to obey them because look at us. We're obeying them. Look how good we are. But their hearts are far from me. Now, let me tell you something. Men, try that with your wife. Try saying, hey, I love you, baby. But, you know, I'm going to go play uh, poker with my buddies seven days a week. I'm going to go play softball. I got friends that do it. I did it for a while. I didn't leave my wife that long. But, like, playing five leagues for softball, seven for flag football or football, you know, go to the bar every night, hang out with my buddies. Try that with your wife, and she's going to start thinking, your heart ain't in this. And women, same thing. If you're not paying attention to your man, he's going to start wondering, well, she says she loves me, but she's never around. Same with the guys. Just, he, he says he loves me, but he's never around. And that's what Jesus is saying here. These people honor me with their lips, but their heart's far from me. They don't know me. They're not preaching the word. They're not following the word. They're making traditions. They're following their own man-made, man-made-up academic traditions. And they're elevating them above the word that I gave them. So they, with their lips, they sound good. This is religious people. This is hypocritical. People who go to church on Sunday, and they look amazing on Sunday, but Monday morning, they're passed out in their front yard drunk. I'm just giving an example. I know one guy that happened to, happened to be a friend of mine. It woke him up, by the way. So anyway, just think of that. Just let's be sincere. Let's be authentic. This is what Jesus is saying. You're all going through the motions. You're all acting. You're not real. You're not committed. You're not following the God that is defined in the Bible. You're following one you made up to suit your lifestyle. Remember that. Remember to follow the God of the Bible as defined by the scriptures don't think you're getting to heaven by following a God you've made up in your mind to suit your lifestyle. Just remember that. Okay. These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They worship me in vain. They worship me in vain, the teachings that are but rules taught by men. And this is the way this should really read. In vain, now they worship me, teaching as doctrine, um, which is applied teaching, the traditions of men so they're teaching this this is what he's saying they're not just doing this as like well this is kind of our tradition they're teaching as doctrine the rules that men have made up and that's false teaching that's hypocritical teaching you claim to be a man of god but you're not following the bible you claim to be a man of god but you're going to follow a book you made up and so you have let go of the commands of god and are holding on to the traditions of men and he said, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. In other words, you have, a, you have a fine way of setting away the word of God, the truth of the scriptures, in order to observe the rules that you've made up yourself that aren't scripture, but traditions made up by men. So we'll stop there today. Remember, tradition should never override the word of God. If you're battling against tradition, it's a tough battle in a church. Hang in there. 
Stick to the scriptures. Speak truth. Walk truth. Live truth. Know the Bible. Know the scriptures. So we're going to stop there at verse 9, and we'll pick up on verse 10 tomorrow. Hope you have a great day.